This has been the most tumultuous week in American politics since the Capitol Hill insurrection, and it's not over yet. Looming over everything is one question. Will Joe Biden stay in the race and face the Caesar of the Republican Party, Donald Trump, who this week chose a running mate, dodged prosecution in the classified documents case, and most dramatically of all, narrowly escaped death from a would-be assassin's bullet? All this and more next. This is Washington Week with The Atlantic. Corporate funding provided by Consumer Cellular. Additional funding is provided by Ku and Patricia Ewan through the Ewan Foundation, committed to bridging cultural differences in our communities. Sandra and Carl DeLay Magnuson, Rose Herschel and Andy Shreves, Robert and Susan Rosenbaum, the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, and by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. Once again, from Washington, Editor-in-Chief of The Atlantic and moderator, Jeffrey Goldberg. Good evening and welcome to Washington Week. It's all been a bit much this past week, but I have an expert panel with me to try to make sense of recent events. Laura Barone Lopez is the White House correspondent for the PBS NewsHour. Elizabeth Bumiller is the Washington Bureau Chief of the New York Times. Leanne Caldwell is an anchor of Washington Post Live and co-author of The Post's Early Brief. And McKay Coppins is a staff writer and my colleague at The Atlantic. Um, so there's too much to do, but we'll try to, we'll try to plow through. Let me start with the, the, this, this huge story that, that, that seems to be changing by the day Joe Biden, in or out. Um, Laura, you've been reporting on this closely. Give us the, the latest state of play. Where is Joe Biden in this process right now? Where's his, where's his thinking? Well, he is largely where he was uh, right after the debate, which is essentially that he and his campaign are saying he is in this race, he's not backing out. Um, he, his campaign had a bit of a coordinated effort in the last 24 hours. We saw them come out forcefully. Jen O'Malley Dillon, the cam campaign chair, went on MSNBC this morning and said, nothing has changed. We are in this race. The fundamentals are still the same. You know, they maintain that polling still shows, that their internals still show, that, that there wasn't, so that, that Donald Trump is not running away with the race and that he, and that, uh, President Biden can still win it when voters are faced with that ultimate choice. So they're not necessarily moving, but even as they're saying that, more and more Democrats and more and more more and more leaks from members of their party show that they aren't. The well, party isn't really with him. This is what I'm. This is what I think you're suggesting is that from Biden's perspective, perhaps nothing is changing, but everything is changing around him. I mean, Leanne, it's like it, you cover this closely. Uh, you know, my theory of of congressional politics is when Nancy Pelosi tells you you're dead, you're dead. Yeah. Uh, you know, you just go, just go lie down because it's over. And Nancy Pelosi is very clearly signaling in many ways and leading the others yeah. in the charge saying this isn't working. So, I mean, how long can Biden withstand that kind of pressure? I mean, ultimately he can withstand it for as, until the election. He can continue to stay in the race. There is nothing that can, that can push him out. It what is his own money, decision. Though? So I'm saying he, it's his decision. He can run a broke campaign with no supporters and no one can push him out. That's the reality. But what's actually happening, does he want to run that sort of campaign? When I'm told there are groups of senators who are talking about coming out in a group to call on President Biden to step down, that hasn't happened yet. They are waiting until they're, we're talking about it today. Maybe they'll wait until Monday to see what transpires over the weekend. There was a lot of those similar conversations among House Democrats as well. Some Democrats started to come out today. Uh, we've had more than a dozen members of Congress, two in the Senate, uh, some in the, the House come out today. So the pressure is building. You know, it's not that there's still division among the party for the most part. There's still some hardcore Biden supporters, but overwhelmingly, I am told by many, many sources in the House and the Senate that Biden has lost Congress. And there doesn't seem to be any way that he can get them back. Elizabeth, you at the time, the Times has some new reporting on this, correct? We, well, we, he, Biden right now is COVID, and he's he's isolated in his beach house in, in Rehoboth, Delaware. And our reporting uh, has him 
people close to him say he's in a very angry. Uh, he feels abandoned by Nancy Pelosi and and uh, his his uh, and Barack Obama. Uh, and uh, you know he's he's we have had reporting that uh, he has been receptive at times to talk about his future. That it, you know and that uh, but then. The aides get out in front and say say that to the press, and then we hear from from the White House or from Rehoboth or, uh, that that he's no, he's in the race. So I think there's a lot of flux right now. It's very fluid. Uh, the family is very adamant he stays in. There are aides around him who think it's over. Uh, other aides think it's not quite as bad as, as all that. So it's it's a very fluid situation. It's unclear what's going to happen next week. There, we have reporting that he'd, he'd like to stay in the race as uh, while Bibi Netanyahu comes to Washington next week and uh, at the re <coughs> invitation of Republicans and addresses Congress. Right. Um, he also has a campaign event uh, next week in Texas. But, but, I mean, coming back to this point about money, it's like, you, you, yeah, you can stay. You can rage against the dying light all you want, but you, you can't run against Donald Trump with no money. And it doesn't seem as if the money story is going to change direction. No, and I, I think ultimately I don't, I don't see how he stays in this race, but it, it's um, taking him a lot longer to get there than, than people expected. And, it, and he feels, you know, he has years of resentments of what he now calls the Democratic elite, you know, the people who he felt like Barack Obama, who never treated, you know, looked, who did not, the, the Democratic elite didn't treat him with respect. And it goes back to 2016. We all know the story where um, he stepped aside for Hillary Rodham Clinton, and we know how that turned out in the 2016 right. presidential race. M McKay, you're an expert on Donald Trump, and uh, it's uh, and congratulations on that, by the way. The, <laughs> what I've, always uh, I've just given you a be. new title, you. a PhD in, <laughs> in Trumpology. Uh, but you know what? Listening to uh, Elizabeth on, on this question, it, it, it you, you know. Joe Biden raging against the I, elites. I've been thinking Joe Biden this. raging generally. I mean, it sounds and like and consumed with resentment and feeling disrespected by his party's elites. Like there are some eerie echoes here in the Biden. Right. Both Donald Trump and Joe Biden now feel disrespected by Barack Obama. I didn't have that on my 2024 <laughs> bingo card, but go yeah, go on. Well, and I do think it's important to kind of think about the psychology here, right? Because Joe Biden like Donald Trump, I mean, they're totally different figures in almost every way, except that both of them at key moments in their political careers were laughed at, you know, not taken seriously, ridiculed by the leaders of their parties, right? Donald Trump responded by kind of making a revenge march to the White House, purging disloyal Republicans, taking over the party. Joe Biden, uh, you know, did something a little different, right? He he did defy expectations in 2020. He won the primary, he won the White House. And, and while he has done his best to unify the party, he has kept a very tight inner circle um, that does not, unlike the Trump White House, does not leak, does not you know, wage kind of turf wars, but that I think has also insulated him from uh, some of the realities that he faces. And uh, that also reminds me of Donald Trump. Yeah, there's a reality right? distortion field yes. at, at work where everybody sitting around, we were just looking at video before when you all were talking of, of Joe Biden coming down the stairs of Air Force One, <clears throat> not elegantly, let's say. And, and we all see what we see. Mm -hmm. um, and that message that we see it or that the country sees it, or the Democratic elites see it, is not penetrating uh, the, the the sort of little fortress in Delaware right now. And, and a large a majority of American voters think he is too old to be president. So. He can rage against the elites, but it's also the voters who have this opinion based on but, what they've seen. But I will say there is the base of the party, some of the activists in the parties mm -hmm. who are completely still in support of President Biden, and they don't want him to step down. And I keep asking people, well, why? And people tell me there's a couple things. First of all, they don't, they feel like their votes will have been stole, taken from them, yeah. from the primary, mm -hmm. if it is someone else. They are worried that someone like Kamala Harris, the f who could be the first black woman 
nominee um, could get skipped over. And also, um, they say that uh, some political strategists say that his age was already baked in yeah. for a lot of people. And so they are just also, fear they've already calculated that and that they are fearful that the Democratic Party is going to screw this up three and a half months before the election. That someone said to me today, they would prefer a weekend at Bernie's come strolling in than Donald Trump, and they're willing to do that with President Biden. They know him, they don't want to take the risks, and they want to move forward. And so it is very complicated here. And the base of the party, there's still many activists who are behind him, like Alex, um, uh, um, AOC. Rep yes, AOC. Yeah, yeah. And, and by the way, I'm old enough to remember when AOC and the left yeah, crowd <laughs> were really mad at Biden over Gaza and were saying, we're going to stay. And now, yeah. I don't understand that switch. Well, what happened is there was some sort of agreement. There was a commitment from President Biden to AOC and Bernie Sanders yeah. about how he's going to switch his campaign messaging, focus on issues, a very economic populist message. And they immediately saw the results of that in his campaign messaging. And so yeah. they think that they have also a lot of power with President Biden. Right. Laura, I, I want to ask you, uh, it, it's a simple question, but when is it too late to change courses for the Democrats? Well, a lot of the Democrats feel like once they hit that virtual roll call, uh, the, Demo the, the Democratic National Convention will hold as early as August 1st, that, uh, that then it would be too late. Because there are some fears from some Democrats that you start uh, toying, you know, potentially with Ballot access, you're asking for litigation, you're asking for legal challenges. That's something that Congresswoman Ocasio-Cortez raised in her hour-long Instagram uh, live video post where she said, we could just be opening the door to chaos if President Biden ultimately steps aside. Right. And so a lot of the Democrats that I've talked to uh, in Congress say that they really want a resolution by Monday. They want to see this said and done by early next week because that, they think, gives them enough time to then start rallying around a plan B, which they say, uh, a, a lot of the ones that I talked to do say they think it would be Kamala Harris and that the party would get behind her. But I was talking to Congresswoman Veronica Escobar today, who is a Biden supporter, has stood by him. She's in the Hispanic caucus, and she was saying that there is not a consensus. She says that amongst her colleagues, there is not a consensus about who they would support if Biden steps aside. And she is really afraid that it is going to become chaotic, uh, that the process is going to fully open, and then Democrats will continue to attack each other uh, and, again, distract from Donald Trump. But let me just play devil's advocate on that for a second. The idea that in our democracy, a party has an open casting call for president, uh, and that they all argue among themselves that's, and have a quick series of debates. That's that sounds healthy. That's that's and that's the view of many in the party and uh, some uh, very senior people in the party that you should not just people who want to be part of the <laughs> right, casting. Right, yeah, right, yeah. right. Yeah. Uh, you know the. Uh, that that would be healthy and that it would it would be a fantastic convention. It would be great TV. I've heard this argument. <laughs> you know, everybody would tune in and you would have some semblance of the, the you know, the delegates at least. Having Pete Buttigieg a, as Kid Rock. <laughs> right. In other words. right. right. So, so that, so, but on the other hand, there are rules that all the money of the Biden campaign would go to Kamala Harris. And right. if, if it, if she is not the nominee, then it would, it would, you'd start at zero. And people say, but of course, there'd be this huge grassroots support and there'd be more money coming in. Right. These are all, this is endless discussion. Right. This it is, I think, a point of contrast, though, that's worth making with the Republican Party, right? The, the way that the Democratic Party is operating right now, it is chaotic and it makes a lot of people nervous. Uh, but it is also a sign of a vital, healthy political party that there is still a willingness to kind of put pressure on what a lot of Democrats see as an increasingly kind of belligerent and detached from reality leader. Mm. Republican Party has not had so much success in that, right? Mm -hmm. Donald Trump uh, has at various points had it, the beginnings of a backlash and he's always managed to tamp it down. So when I talk to Democrats, they will sometimes say, look, th this might be ugly, but it is a sign of a functioning political party acting like a political party. Right, and and in the, in the Darwinian process, you might get a very potent candidate you didn't otherwise yeah. know would emerge. Yeah, go ahead. No, no, no. <laughs> just I, to just, say, it, but then the, the other, other uh, 
thing people say is that, but of course, all the, the would-be nominees, Gavin Newsom, Gretchen Whitmer, none of them, they all poll below Biden right now. Now that the argument against that is, but of course, no one knows they once they, they're on the top. But the of election ticket. isn't today. Yeah, right. right. So, I mean, but, but I want to talk yeah. about uh, I want to talk about the con the Republican convention and, and Donald Trump and McKay. I wanted to uh, read you something uh, that you wrote. You we posted last night. Um, for a brief moment, Americans saw Donald Trump try something new, stick to a script. Addressing delegates at the Fiserv, I don't even know how to pronounce that. Fiserv, is that right? <laughs> Fiserv Forum in Milwaukee. The former president, yeah, it takes a little time. And freshly anointed Republican nominee read slowly and dramatically from a teleprompter as he recounted his near-death experience in Butler, Pennsylvania. Um, but what happened, la what happened last night that we saw was Trump read for about 15 minutes and then started talking about the amazing amount of blood that can come out of your ear, uh, which is a very interesting subject, but not in the script. And then he sort of went, yeah. went back to Trump. I want to play this one clip from the speech because I think this is, this is emblematic of where Trump is, uh, if we could just play that. They're coming from prisons. They're coming from jails. They're coming from mental institutions and insane asylums. I, I you know, the press is always on me because I say this. Has anyone seen Silence of the Lambs? <laughs> the late, great Hannibal Lecter. <laughs> He'd love to have you for dinner. That's insane asylums. They're emptying out their insane asylums. He's talking about immigrants, obviously. This was not in the script. There was this idea this week that Donald Trump was a changed man yeah. because of the assassination. That's not a changed man. That's, that's, that's pre-assassination attempt rally. What's so bizarre about it is that all week leading up to that speech, the message coming out of the Trump campaign again and again in Milwaukee was that you were going to see a new Trump, right? That he wanted to bring the country together. He wanted to lower the temperature. He's rising to the moment. This was Chris Lasavita, campaign manager, kept making this point in every interview that I saw him give. Um, speaking to delegates, they, they kind of embraced this narrative that he had been humbled by his near-death experience. We even saw reporting that people said he had had some kind of spiritual renewal. I mean, the, 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 the idea that he was going to get up on that stage and be fundamentally different than he has been uh, was pretty widespread in Milwaukee, and it lasted about 10 or 15 minutes. I was in, in the arena while he was speaking, and more interesting than watching him on stage was watching the teleprompter that he was <laughs> reading from, because right around the 15-minute mark, it just stopped scrolling, and he was off riffing about crazy Nancy Pelosi and Joe Biden, the worst president in history, and uh, defaced the nation, all his favorite partisan epithets. He, he, he can't help himself. And I think that by the end of that speech and talking to delegates afterward, they had already kind of abandoned the notion of a new Trump. Not, Trump was back to his old self. I'm just surprised that people thought that somehow he, he was going to be a new Trump because of the fact that even before we got to the speech, when he posted on Truth Social after the assassination attempt, he was posting about the January 6th case hoax. Mm -hmm. He was going after prosecutors in the judicial system. That's the old Trump. Uh, he still is the same Trump. And also, Republicans in the lead-up to his speech weren't necessarily changing their tone at the RNC. They were talking about mass deportations. They were t uh, lying about non-citizens voting in hordes and going to rig the election. Democrats are going to rig the elections with non-citizens voting days before Trump took the stage. So this was not some some changed Republican party. Although I will, I will just attempt. say, I think you're right, but I will say the most interesting thing was seeing some of the RNC speakers try to graft a unifying message on top of what they were already saying. Kimberly Guilfoyle had a couple really weird lines of rhetoric about transcending political hatreds. Uh, Kellyanne Conway uh, made this point. You could see them kind of, it was almost like they were speaking in a second language that they weren't quite fluent in, uh, trying to speak the language of unity, and then falling right back into their normal yeah, yeah. MAGA rhetoric. Go ahead. You know, he's interesting that his campaign this time around is way more, it's a good, way more professional yes. than they were in 2016. He's got good campaign managers, but they still have the same candidate. Right. And so, you know, you, you still have to tame the candidate, and worked for about 15 minutes, as you said, and then, and then he went back to 
uh, remind me of the old Trump. It reminded me of what we used to say when he was in the White House. Was people would say, "Oh, he's going to be presidential now." Remember that the first <laughs> year that, he, and it, we waited a long time. You know? Yeah, I mean, the, we've the been promised fourteen or sixteen times some right. sort of. So my, my question is, I mean, how the assassination attempt, this terrible moment in in in, in our history now, the, how, how this assassination attempt changes Trump's relationship to his own personality, to God, we're not going to be able to, 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 to figure out. My, my question is, how does it ch change the race, or does it change the race? I don't think it changes the race. I mean, at least in the focus groups that I've been sitting in on all week, and some of them were with two-time Trump voters, uh, they said that they weren't changing their vote. And those two-time Trump voters, yes, this is just nine people in that one uh, uh -huh. focus group. Yeah. But they said they weren't going to vote for Trump. They also said they weren't going to vote for Joe Biden and Kamala Harris, that they were going to either write in third party or leave it blank. But these were two-time Trump voters that said they weren't going to vote for Trump anymore because they had already made their decision. And that was after the assassination attempt. And then there were swing voters that also said similar things, which was that the assassination attempt did not change uh, what their decision was at all about the race. But Leanne, does it motivate the base to make sure that every last member of the base comes out? I mean, does it? I mean, that's what this absolutely does. Like the assassination attempt, absolutely. I mean, the delegates at that convention, Trump was a God-like figure there. They were literally equating him to God, being able to escape, the, escape death. So yes, but many Republicans I talked to, elected officials, I talked to you know Richard Hudson, chair of the NRCC, Speaker Mike Johnson, and they think that there could perhaps, they don't have polling yet, there could be a little bit of an empathy bump. It's not going to be two points, three points, but it, there, it could be that, especially when you pair it with President Biden's debate performance. And I know, you know, I have a little bit different of a take on this convention. For the most part, yes, there were those old, you know, Trump moments and there were the, you know, you know, the mass deportation and that stuff. But by and far, they largely avoided the most controversial components of the Republican Party. There was no mention, there was very little mention, um, just minor speakers of, uh, of pardoning January 6th right. rioters. There was not really any talk about abortion, no talk about guns, really. Um, very little talk about a stolen election in 2020. And so it was a production that tried to appeal to the mainstream using very the polling, very polling metrics that play within the Republican Party and against some of the But election right. deniers were everywhere in the convention. Yes, but the, and they were all, right. fake electors were everywhere. But the people don't see that, like the public. Uh, Elizabeth, let me talk about another aspect of the convention, probably the most uh, interesting aspect, the choice of J.D. Vance. Um, does that help the ticket? Makes it look younger, more vital. Uh, Trump made clear that this is his. This is his. Uh, this is the political future for the Republican Party. He got a good. I mean, I thought his his except his speech was was lower key than I expected. It's almost like he didn't want to upstage Trump. I some I thought a little bit, but um, he's not really. That's called self preservation. Right. In the context <laughs> of, and he of, worked very hard to be the nominee. I mean, right. But I, you know, he's not. Uh, I, I th he was well received. I, you know, I was interested to see how the Wall Street Journal is going after him now for not really being a true Republican. You right. know, he wants he's talking about perhaps <clears throat> raising taxes, all this sort of. You know, will that matter? I don't know. It, but, by the way, the idea of real Republican is so interesting. McKay, you, yeah. you you obviously wrote a, a biography of Mitt Romney, who wasn't there. Um, the other living Republican ex-president George W. Bush wasn't there. The three ex-living vice presidents weren't there. It's not the Republican Party. It's not the Republican yeah. Party. It's some sort of Trump. hybrid of Republican Party isolationist and ultimate fighting I, I in a kind of way. I mean, I, I was checking in with uh, uh, many of those Republicans who were not there and would have been in past Republican conventions throughout the week. I was texting them. And the, the overwhelming sentiment from them was not just wow, I disagree with a lot of what I'm hearing. Wow, I really don't like the J.D. Vance pick. I did hear some of that. More than anything, it was an overwhelming apathy about what was happening in Milwaukee. The Mitt Romney's and Paul Ryan's and Dick Cheney's, George W. Bush's, they, they are so far removed from what the GOP has become that it's almost like watching, you know, some kind of distant spectacle. Like, they, they feel totally 
not invested in this party anymore. And it's because of genuine ideological transformation that has happened in this let, let me ask you in a few seconds that we have left, Laura, does, would there, would that group, if it supported Joe Biden, would it make a difference? Or are they sort of just castaways? I think it potentially could. And we're, a lot of those Republicans, like the Adam Kinzingers of the world, say that if, if it is Joe Biden, they're going to stick with him and they're going to try to get those, those independents and Nikki Haley voters to go to Biden. It's all fascinating. We have so much more to cover, but unfortunately, we need to leave it there for now. Um, I want to thank our panelists for joining us and for sharing their reporting. And to our viewers at home, thanks for joining us. Before we go, I want to take note of the conviction in Russia of the Wall Street Journal reporter Evan Gershkovich on sham spying charges. Gershkovich was sentenced to 16 years in prison in a kangaroo court, and we all stand in solidarity with him and with the Journal as it continues to fight for his release. And we look forward to the day when Evan can join his fellow reporters on this program, and we wish him continued strength. I'm Jeffrey Goldberg. Good night from Washington. Corporate funding for Washington Week with The Atlantic is provided by... Consumer Cellular, this is Sam. How may I help you? This is a pocket dial. Well, somebody's pocket. Thought I'd let you know that with Consumer Cellular, you get nationwide coverage with no contract. That's kind of our thing. Have a nice day. Additional funding is provided by... Ku and Patricia Ewan through the Ewan Foundation, committed to bridging cultural differences in our communities. Sandra and Carl DeLay Magnuson, Rose Herschel and Andy Shreves, Robert and Susan Rosenbaum, the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, and by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you.